So welcome to the class on Kabbalah. We just had the blessing before studying sacred matters. And one of the things that I think you may come, I hope you will come to appreciate, is that from a Kabbalistic perspective, when a Jew does a mitzvah, a little bit of the universe is healed. And that's why we say the blessing before doing it, because we acknowledge that what we're doing here is not just learning, not just attending a class, but again, from a, from a Jewish perspective, from, particularly from a mystical perspective, what we're doing here has cosmic significance. So uh, thank you for joining us. I am going to begin a uh, presentation. And so can it, the first big question is, can everybody see it? Yes. Okay, yes. terrific. And so generally speaking, I can't see, I can only see a few of you. I can't see all of you. And um, so if you have a question, there is a way of raising your hand electronically uh, through, if you click on the participants window and I, and I even can't do that now, I'm not even sure if I would see that. Um, Ken, why don't you do that? Just so I can see if I, if I see your hand get raised. Uh, well, Larry just raised his hand. So I just wanted to show you. Okay, thank you. So I may see it. If I don't see it, just chime in. We, we are, uh, you know, we have about 25 people or so, maybe. Um, thank you, Suzanne, uh, for raising your hand. Um, and I wonder, I probably can't. Oh, yeah, I think I can. I, okay. Now I have two. Okay. So, okay. Um, so welcome to Kabbalah. Uh, we have three sessions for the three next Tuesday nights. And I plan to record uh, the sessions. And um, so if you miss a session, you'll be able to go back and, and, and see it. And if you're taking me seriously about needing to, uh, to do this 10 times, you can watch it 10 times and see if that helps. <laughs> I'll be really curious to see if that helps. Um, session one is introduction, a little bit about history. Session two is about the Zohar, which is the central <coughs> text on Kabbalah and the Ten Sfirot. Uh, session three uh, covers Lurianic Kabbalah, the soul, angels, and enhancing our Jewish spirituality. Um, this is a word from my sponsor, um, the Jewish Federation of Ventura County, who employs me on a part-time basis as uh, a community rabbi. And so uh, originally this was gonna be a live class at Temple Bat Torah. And in the current day and age, we have opened it up. I also serve Temple Adad Elohim as a scholar in residence. And I encourage you to be generous with both. Um, for copies of the slides, you can go to my website. If you haven't been to my website, it's a pretty easy name. It's just lotker.com. Um, if you open up the website, you will see a menu. One menu choice will say classes. And then there'll be two choices, lectures and classes, and then a particular, another choice about my Jewish literacy class. On the, on the lectures and classes will be listed all of the handouts, and, and in fact, copies of these slides. So I have a one session talk on Kabbalah. This is the three session class. And then I have copies of the text because I know the texts are gonna be a little hard to read. And even when you print it out, I think my PDF are four pages to a, to, a, to a page, so they're a little hard to read, but, but I have copies of all the texts just by clicking there. And then I have a suggested reading list, um, uh, which will take you a good deal of the rest of your life. <laughs> um, so some basic facts about Judaism. Um, I, I include this because not everybody is Jewish. It turns out, I don't know if you're aware of that. Uh, not everybody in the world is Jewish, <laughs> who, who knew? <laughs> Um, the central focus of Judaism is on acts and actions rather than belief. Jews count 613 commandments, the, word for, the Hebrew word for commandment is mitzvah, plural mitzvot, in the first five books of the Bible, the Torah alone. Um, particularly, uh, most people are aware of the Big Ten. And then uh, there are many other commandments, what people are aware certainly applies to Jews and others. Love your neighbor, love the stranger, love God, don't eat pork, pay wages promptly. Um, a week ago in our, our Torah study session, we talked about the holiness code, which talks a lot about 
both ethical and ritual commandments. And I would say the Jewish focus is on this world rather than the next. Uh, when we Jews speak of salvation, we are often talking about how do we make this world better rather than some sense of what will happen to our soul in the next world. Kabbalah in particular will say a lot about the soul and a lot about the next world. But for Jews, the idea of salvation is almost political. It's about making this world better. And Kabbalah has some uh, very interesting and I would say revolutionary things to say about. The word Kabbalah uh, means received, meaning the received tradition. I, I love to point out that if you go to Israel and you check into a hotel, behind the, ho behind the, 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 uh, the place where you check in, you will see the Hebrew word Kabbalah uh, and the English word reception. So it's, it means reception in both a mystical sense or that which is received in a mystical sense and also in a very common sense. The goal of Kabbalah is to get closer to God and even to cleave to God. There's a concept called Devekut, which comes from the same Hebrew word as the word for glue. So the idea here is how do we get closer to God? It is built on top of Judaism. Uh, it's not an alternative to Judaism, but a deeper practice. And so a true Kabbalist would start off being Orthodox and then apply uh, you know, many, many practices and this philosophy to get deeper and deeper into Judaism to get closer and closer to God. We hear a lot, maybe not as much as we used to, about Pop Kabbalah with Madonna and tattoos and, and red strings and, and so on. But in, in the same way that if I wear a stethoscope, that doesn't make me a doctor. That's true, right, Ken Elman? Uh, simply wearing a stethoscope does not make you a doctor. Uh, so wearing a red string or even having a copy of the, of the Zohar uh, on your bookshelf doesn't make you a Kabbalist. This is not supposed to be simple or easy or even quickly understandable. Those of you who have spent some time studying this uh, can attest to that fact, and I can attest to that fact. Kabbalah was traditionally studied by men, male scholars over the age of 40 uh, who were married. And the, the, this was for several reasons. First, so that they wouldn't be tempted to abandon their earthly responsibilities. You can get carried away with this stuff and want to just go off in, you know, into the mountains and chant and meditate day and night. But some of the commandments that Judaism teaches is you're supposed to have children, you're supposed to have a job. There's lots of things which you are obligated under Jewish law to do. And uh, the idea was they only wanted students with a sufficient level of maturity to, um, to engage in the study of Kabbalah. It was uh, studied by people of high moral standards, prior rabbinic learning, and mental emotional stability. It was traditionally studied one-on-one, -on -one. so one teacher and one student. And there the idea was it, it's so easy to misunderstand these concepts that by studying one-on-one, -on -one, uh, the likelihood of, of misunderstanding would be reduced. And the goal of our class is to provide you with an introduction and an orientation. And by the way, you know, unless we get carried away with questions, uh, you know, I, I, I enjoy answering questions as they occur to you. Uh, Suzanne, you have your hand up, I see. That. No, I don't. I'm sorry. Oh, okay, I'm going to lower it. Okay. Um, okay. With yarn. Okay, so first, a number of disclaimers. I am a student of Kabbalah. I am not a Kabbalist for reasons I will share. There's a lot about Kabbalah that troubles me greatly, and I will share those with you. Uh, behind me, you see part of my library. Uh, and I have, I think I once counted something like 120 books on the subject. And I've actually read most of them, some of which several times. One, at least I can think of, I've read six times. Um, and I finally got it. Um, I will be sharing with you my struggle to learn this world. And as, as I mentioned, and Suzanne and I were, were talking about it as we began, there's a value to hearing difficult concepts many times. 
And my own impression is I need to study something about 10 times before I deeply get it. Um, so the question now is, why are you here? Let me see if I can open this up so I can see you. So um, I'll just ask, and I don't know how many people I have, but I'll ask, um, you know, your interest and how you would define spirituality. We were talking about this a little bit today. And why do you think there is such a renewed interest in Kabbalah these days? So uh, just unmute yourself and chime in. And we'll, we'll see if it works, if you want to answer. I'll join in. Okay. Uh, I really never studied Kabbalah. I've been a Jew for a long, long time. But I personally believe that I am a different type of a Jew. And I'm trying to learn a little bit about spirituality and I guess Kabbalah is the place to begin. Okay, thank you. Any other thoughts on how you would define spirituality? If anybody wants to add to that. Uh, yes, Valerie. I think people are dissatisfied at this point with all that they've obtained. They feel like they've reached a certain level as a society. You know, we have all of these tangible goods that we've been able to obtain and still not find fulfillment. So I define spirituality as that intangible fulfillment that we're able to find meaning in our lives and try to fill that gap that we feel is missing. Nice, nice. Any other thoughts? We get back to the presentation. This is Bryce. Yeah, um, Bryce. <clears throat> a couple thoughts. One, I think one reason why many people are drawn to um, mystical uh, pursuits especially in times of crisis like this, is it, uh, it gives many people a feeling that they're possibly more in control. Um, another thought, at least for me, about what spirituality is for me is that uh, I, I'm, I'm a big believer in science and, and understanding the physical world, but I also know that the way that our our minds are organized is not necessarily a, a direct mirror of the physical world. Mm -hmm. And there are things that seem real to us that you physically can't demonstrate, but still give emotional or a satisfaction to learning and seeing. Okay. Very nice. Um, I am gonna go back to the presentation. So um, just to, to, to comment on the resurgence, one of my teachers, Arthur Green, who's written several of the books on the reading list, set, talked about the resurgence of Kabbalah as a reaction to the, to the idea that in some sense, pure science has failed us. There was a belief, I would say, starting maybe 150 years ago, that with the advancement of science, the world would be made a better and better and better and even more perfect place. And then with the wars of the last century, um, we realize that just because a culture, let's take Germany, is highly educated and sophisticated in science and technology doesn't necessarily mean the result will be a better world. So that was one of uh, uh, Rabbi Green's insights. So in terms of definition of spirituality, remember I said I'm gonna have a lot of text. And I don't know that I will read all of them, but here's a uh, text from, there's a wonderful book called The Jewish Light Spirituality Handbook by Stuart Matlins. And he's got essays on, on lots of different <laughs> subjects. Um, so I'll read a few of these. Spirituality may be inclusively regarded as the sum efforts of the human psyche individually and collectively to attune to the impulses and rhythms of the universe whether internal to the individual or external to the individual. Uh, I like Nancy uh, Fuchs Kreimer. Spirituality, as I understand it, is noticing the wonder, noticing that what seems disparate and confusing to us is actually whole. That's actually gonna be a continuing theme in Kabbalah 
that everything really is whole and connected. Um, let's see. R Larry Kushner, who's one of my heroes uh, and teachers, the immediacy of God's presence. Um, Rabbi Jeffrey Weisblatt, spirituality is essentially a way of responding to God, becoming conscious of God. Um, uh, Kerry Olitsky, one of my colleagues, spirituality is the process through which the individual strives to meet God. Um, so one question I often get asked is, is it Kabbalah or Kabbalah? And the answer is both. Um, Kab Kabbalah is the Ashkenazi way of pronunciation, like saying Shabbos or Talis for the Sabbath and a prayer shawl. Ashkenazim are the Jews of Eastern Europe. 95% um, of American Jews are uh, Ashkenazi in origin. And, uh, sorry? I'm sorry, Rabbi Locker, I gotta mute myself. Okay, and Kabbalah is a Sephardic way of pronouncing the word, like Shabbat or Talit, and Sephardi Sephardim are the Jews of Spanish and Middle Eastern origin. So I, I was glad that, that Bryce mentioned the idea of getting control of the world, and I do think uh, people are attracted to religion and to mysticism uh, with this idea that you can get control of the world, like if you wear the right crystal uh, and so on. So I love to draw this distinction between what I consider to be magic and what I consider to be mystic. Magic suggests if I follow all the commandments perfectly, pray correctly, use ritual objects, you know, pray in, in Hebrew or Aramaic, keep strictly kosher, have these funny little mezuzahs on every doorpost, and I do all that good stuff, I can get God to do my will. And that's very much in line with, with, um, with what Bryce was saying a moment ago about getting control. The mystic suggests something that sounds similar but is profoundly different. And that is if I follow all the commandments perfectly, pray correctly, use ritual objects and so on, same list, I can get me to do God's will. I would say that's the difference between a mystic and someone who has sort of a magical idea of religion in general, uh, spirituality in general, and certainly Kabbalah. And speaking of magic, I, I, there's a lot of things I just can't help myself from mentioning. You've heard the word abracadabra. Uh, scholars believe this is actually from the Aramaic. I knew you were going to guess that. Avra kadabra, meaning I create as I speak. And it's even more interesting because the verb bara is a verb which means create, but in the, in the Bible, uh, it's only used by God's creation, uh, such as in the opening line of, of, of the book of Genesis. And one of my students, uh, give, I, look, I give us a talk on, on why I love Hebrew, suggests that maybe this was God's flourish. Before the Torah, God introduces by saying, Avrakadabra, and it got picked up. Um, <laughs> Jewish spirituality begins with the study of sacred text. I mentioned that earlier. Um, I actually thought I was going to have a bunch of Christians from a, from a Lutheran church joining me. Maybe we have, and I, I haven't seen them yet. Um, Christianity focuses on the personhood of Jesus. Jewish spirituality focuses on digging deeply into sacred texts. The presumption is that our Bible and other sacred texts, such as the Talmud, the Zohar, are infinitely rich and infinitely deep in meaning. One of my teachers suggested what I consider to be a beautiful idea. Like a mat, this is like a love letter from God. So imagine you, you were on the proverbial desert island and you got one long, long love letter from the dearest and most important person in your life, the love of your life. Uh, and you knew that that was the only communication you would ever get from this person. You would read the text over and over again. You would wonder why certain letters are written larger and certain letters are written smaller and certain misspellings are there when you knew that your lover knew how to spell and you would search it and search it and search it for deep meanings. Um, that's what's going on here with Jewish spirituality. I once met someone who said, you know, this actually happened to me. 
And I said, what are you talking about? Were you on a desert island? She said, no. I had this great relationship with a guy and he wrote me a letter to break up. I think this was before emails and texting. And <laughs> in this letter, which he hand wrote, anybody remember handwriting? It's an ancient Kabbalistic technique. Uh, in the letter which he hand wrote, he wrote the words, you are very, and then she couldn't tell whether he was writing lonely or lovely because of the, of the way he wrote. And she never had the courage to ask him. But that's Kabbalistic. We're going to see things in the text which can have multiple meanings. And we definitely will have the courage to ask. And we'll assume that God has no problem putting multiple meanings into a single bit of text. But basically what we do is we read and reread for messages from the most obvious to the most hidden. And it leads to commandments and connection to your actions in this world. So I'm going to look at some text in, uh, in simple form and in deeper form. So first, this is, um, uh, this is a text from Sefer Habahir in the 12th century. Uh, simple, but significant. Whoever delves into mysticism cannot help but stumble. As it is written, the stumbling block is in your hand. You cannot grasp these things unless you stumble over them. Robin, I'll call on you in a second. So one of the things that's going on here is they're going to talk about mysticism. It's Ma'asei Vereshit, the work of creation, or Ma'asei Merkava, the work or the story of the Merkava. That's the chariot. This is Ezekiel's chariot. Um, and then it says the stumbling block is in your hand. Uh, that's from the book of Isaiah. And then the Talmud talks about uh, the stumbling block is in your hand. One does not understand the words of Torah unless you've stumbled over them. Um, so, Robin, you had a question, I think, or you raised your hand. Yes, please. Can you just make the text larger? I can't read it. No, I can't, actually. Well, I guess I just did. Does that make it better? <laughs> yes, thank you. Okay. How do you like that? I didn't know. Okay, I will try, but it's going to get even smaller. And that's why I've included um, copies of the text on my website. Um, so more text. This is from Moses Cordovero, 16th century. And I'm going to just read the yellow highlighting, but really the whole text is very powerful. And he's giving advice to those of us who are beginning to study Kabbalah. Oh, maybe I'll do it like this. Okay, that should help a little, right? Ah, thank okay. you. Okay, what should your intention be as you draw near to this wisdom? Pursuing the straight path, dividing your time between Bible, Talmud, and this wisdom. Partaking of each, learning this wisdom for its own sake, to enter its mysteries, to know your creator, to attain a wondrous level of comprehension of the Torah, to pray in the presence of your creator, to unite the blessed Holy One and the Shekhinah, by enacting the mitzvot. I want to dwell on this one for a moment. Um, we're going to see that a Kabbalistic understanding is not simply unity or three is in a trinity, but tenfold. And the Shekhinah, which in biblical language simply means the presence of God, uh, has the interesting aspect in that it's a feminine word. And so the mystics who are very into personifying God and giving materiality and physical aspects to God are going to understand the Shekhinah is the goddess and they're going to understand a sexual relationship between HaKadosh Baruch Hu and Shekhinah, uh, even though they're all one. Uh, and the idea is we're going to see this, I don't remember if it's tonight or a little bit later, that when you do a mitzvah like putting on a talit or helping a poor person, you are actually helping to unify God who is in some sense broken since the destruction of the temple. So I'll just try and highlight a few other things. Try and learn from someone who has followed paths of integrity as far as possible. Good question. And then he, he I'm sorry? Yeah, sorry, Valerie, sorry. go ahead. Um, in terms of the feminine versus masculine aspects of God, does that play into the concept of Bina? A Bina? Yeah. Yes, because Bina is going to be God's womb. When we, when we just, you, you're talking about Bina in terms of the, the Sferot? Yeah. Okay, so we're going to see the Sferot, the structure of God. 
right. ha- has a womb, has a phallus, has a, um, a, a point, almost like a sperm. Uh, the, the, the Kabbalists get very sexual. Okay. Um, and, and absolutely, that's another feminine aspect of God. Um, his recommendation on the books are basically focusing on the Zohar, said to be written by Shimon Bar Yochai. Let's see what else we have. Peruse these books in two ways. First, go over the language of the text many times, taking notes to remember fluently. Do not delve deeply at first. Second, study with great concentration according to your ability. Even if it seems you do not understand, do not stop, because God will faithfully help you discover hidden wisdom. If something in this wisdom seems doubtful to you, wait. As time passes, it will be revealed to you. And let's see if I can. I don't, I'm gonna, oh, this actually works pretty well. Okay, we, I have two people raising hands, and I don't know who they are. Well, and now I do know who they are. Robin, are you still have your hand raised or not? No. Erwin, you have your hand raised? Yes. Okay. Uh, I don't want to misquote you, but I think one of your lectures, what I attended, you explained uh, that the Torah is like uh, a feminine uh, person who is covered with different layers of veil. And we, as we take the veil uh, away, we are exposed ourselves, we learn uh, more and more. And yeah, I we're think, actually going to, we are going to read that text. Okay. And I, I think uh, after you uh, uh, ta- taught me this, uh, I uh, read the Torah many, many times. And each time I read the Torah, depends what type of spiritual level I am, I f- find uh, different messages in yes, the I have, same I have, text. And that's, you know, the idea of reading it many times. Um, plays in there. We're actually going to read the specific text. It's called The Old Man and the Ravishing Maiden. Um, It's one of my favorite texts from the Zohar. Uh, I don't think we're reading it tonight. I think maybe next time. Um, One of the aspects of Hebrew is like Spanish and many languages, it is a gendered language. So every word is, is either masculine or feminine, and there is no word for it in Hebrew. It's either he or she. Words that end in ah, like Torah, Shekhinah, Kabbalah, are feminine in nature. And so the rabbis, you know, a a grammarian might just say, well, that's just the nature of the language. Don't attach sexual implications to it. Remember the essential underlying supposition in Kabbalah is everything is infinite in meaning and therefore will attach meanings to absolutely everything, including uh, gender. Okay, so let's begin with the beginning. This is the opening of the Torah as it is written in a Torah scroll. And the opening reads, Bereshit bara Elohim et shamayim vehet aretz, and so on. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Uh, you notice there are no vowels. There's no punctuation. There are decorations to the letters, which are really interesting. So the first question a good Kabbalist will ask is why begin the Torah with the letter bet? And of course, you're right. If they began it with any other letter, we'd ask that question also. And so uh, the first letter of the Bible is the letter bet. Why begin with this letter? So for one thing, to teach you that you can't ask what happened above, uh, before, above, or below the Torah. Look at this letter carefully, or I can go back. Look at this letter here. I can only go in this direction. If I try and go in this direction, what happened before the Torah? I get stuck. If I ask what's above the Torah, I get stuck. If I ask what's below the Torah, I get stuck. The source of all knowledge is in this direction, namely in the Torah. And of course, physicists now say this is also true of the Big Bang. You can't meaningfully ask what happened before the Big Bang. Uh, That's a meaningless question. And if people are really interested in the discussion toward the end, I can answer that because I think most of you or many of you know that I'm also a physicist uh, rather than uh, uh, my first career. Another reason, and as a midrash, which 
talks about all the letters fighting for the honor of being first in the Torah. And so another reason is to teach us that there are two Torahs. Bet is the second letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and it also stands for the number two. So this is to teach us that there are two Torahs, the written Torah, the first five books of the Bible, given to Moses on Mount Sinai, and the oral Torah, which becomes the Talmud. So even in the written Torah, the very first letter, say the mystics, the Kabbalists, is to remind us that there's also an oral Torah. Um, you cannot simply translate the Bible. And we learned that lesson in the first two words of the, uh, of the Torah. The opening of the Bible reads, Bereshit bara Elohim, which is often translated as, in the beginning God created, or in the beginning of God's creation. There's lots of ways people translate this. But if we wanted to say, in the beginning God created, we wouldn't say Bereshit, we would say Bereshana. Uh, Bereshit is half of an expression. The rules of Hebrew grammar require that following the word Bereshit, we should have a noun. But we don't have a noun, we have a verb, bara. So, um, you know, I always say, maybe God wasn't so good at Hebrew grammar. Uh, and I have great sympathy for that because I am neither good at Hebrew grammar nor English grammar. But of course, the rabbis would never say that. And Rashi summarizes rabbinic teaching as saying that what God was teaching us is you cannot translate. If you try and simply translate the Bible, you get stuck between word one and word two. It's impossible to translate. It literally, it says, in the beginning of, and now I need a noun, but the text doesn't have a noun. So my addition to this is maybe God put the lesson here between word one and word two for those mm -hmm. of us who are a little ADD and our attention might be wandering. So uh, it's placed where we absolutely can't miss it. Another um, very significant element in the Torah that will have great significance in Kabbalah is when God creates humanity. So we're in Genesis 1, verse 26. And God said, let us make humanity in our image. Uh, uh, tzel can mean image, but it can also mean shadow. And we're going to see the Kabbalists have a lot of fun, and I have a lot of fun with that question with that idea that we are not only in made in God's image, but we are God's shadow. I think that's session three, we're gonna talk about that. So I love to ask this question. If we're created in God's image, what does that say about uh, God? And what does it say about us? I just opened up the screen so I can see you. So you can, uh, Erwin, you wanna chime in? Yeah, I, I just wanted to ask you because uh, you said that why bait is the first word. Uh, and first letter. Why bet first is the first letter. letter. First yes. letter. Because if they would have used Aleph, Aleph is silent. Okay, but Aleph is the first letter in the Ten Commandments. Uh -huh. Yeah, well, uh, here. In so, the so in the Midrash, uh, God tells Aleph he didn't select Aleph because Aleph begins the word Arur. Uh, and other words for curses. Mm -hmm. And bet begins baruch, which is the word for blessing. That's it. Okay. Uh, so what is it, if we're made in God's image, what does that say about us? What does it say about God? Deborah, you have your hand up. Well, it says that God has many, many faces. Many faces? Many faces. Oh, nice. I like that. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Okay. Any other thoughts on, I can lower your hand. Uh, Jay? Yeah. Without, without being too facetious, only thinking of myself. If I'm creating God's image, does that mean that God is short-tempered? Uh, well, I think you can make a great biblical argument for God being very short-tempered. Um, if you look at the story of the flood, um, God, which we've been studying Saturday mornings, God seems to get really, really short-tempered. Um, yeah, I would say God has a temper. Uh, uh, Ken. So there's a beautiful midrash that that it says that Salmenu in in our image he's you're, it's a plural 
Um, and so the question is, who, who is the we that he's talking about us? Okay, and we're gonna um, get right- It happens right sort of. after all the animals are created. And mm -hmm. so the, the Midrash says, well, it's, it's the heavenly voice, the heavenly presence, and the animals. And so he's saying, in our image, so we have a part of the animalistic part of us and part of the holy part of us. And yeah. we, are, we are a combination of them. And you, as you will see, that's on my next slide. Um, <laughs> I'll just point out, well, let me call on uh, Cheryl and then Suzanne. Hello, I'm, I'm... Okay. Cheryl, did you want to say something? Uh, if, yeah, if, if, if we're in Genesis, uh, you know, Adam and Eve have been in the Garden of Eden, and God is is anthropomorphized. He's actually with us, and it gives you the impression that God walks with us and mm -hmm. has legs. And it isn't until we move to other books, you know, like in uh, Leviticus, and uh, we go out of Egypt, that God all of a sudden now seems to be above us in the heavens and in a cloud, and as the, uh, you know, the Mishkan moves, God moves with us, knows yes. to come with us, and it's a different kind of God, depending on whether you're talking about the peace source or, you know, a, a different source. Somehow, the, whoever wrote it, they changed the image of God. Yes, so it's a developing idea. The traditional Jewish answer to the point that Ken raised about why does it say our image, you know, when in almost every other part of the Torah and the Bible, God speaks in the first person singular. I am the Lord thy God speaks the very deep voice. I am the Lord thy God who took you out of Egypt to be your God. It's only in this connection with this story that God speaks in the first person plural. The traditional Jewish answer is God was speaking to the angels, let us make humanity in our image. The traditional Christian answer is God was speaking to God's triune self. And as Ken indicated, the answer that both he and I like is God was talking to the animals. So we have both divine and animal natures. And I believe this is a proof text for evolution. Sure. In effect, God is saying, okay, creation that I've made on the first six days, together we are gonna make humanity. Uh, so now, while we're talking about God's image, does God have an image? Uh, the Bible's portrayal of God is very anthropomorphic. I mean, Cheryl, you're talking about where God is. Is he down in the garden with us or somewhere in a cloud or up in the heavens? But, the, but God speaks. Many people see God. Uh, the idiom for God being angry is God's nose gets red or heated. Uh, God takes us out of Egypt with an outstretched hand. Um, God is very anthropomorphic in the Bible. The philosophers, notably Maimonides, will say, this is just because the Torah has to speak in the language of people, and you know, don't take it literally. But the Torah itself is very uh, literal, and Maimonides will, Maimonides will basically say, uh, ascribing an image to God is blasphemy. Maimonides has a very interesting way of putting it. He says, you can't say anything positive about God. And he means something that you think he means. He's saying, you can't say God is strong. Because whatever image you have of strength, God is so much stronger than that, that to simply say God is strong, whatever you mean by strong, is blasphemy. What he said was, you can make negative statements about God. God is not weak. That Maimonides is okay with. But for Maimonides and the Jewish philosophers, heavily influenced by Islam, by the way, uh, they are going to try and get away from any sort of anthropomorphism. The Kabbalists will go overboard in the opposite direction and just go to town with physical images and ideas about God. Uh, Bryce, I think you have your hand up. Yeah, well, a couple of things. One, uh, in my business, <clears throat> when we talk about image, we're not talking about anything that you can see uh, in the computer oh, business. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Yes, but we, you know, you would take a disk image, okay, mm -hmm. and uh, and it is absolutely, completely symbolic and abstract, and has and has has no physical meaning. It has physical instantiations 
but the image itself does not physically exist. Yeah, that's very interesting. I, my guess is when the Torah was written, what they meant by tzelem was a physical image, but, but you're absolutely right. And I, I never thought of that. That's and there's great, one other great. thought too, yeah. is that, uh, that God, you know, it, it, it doesn't make sense to me that God would only be strong. I mean, everything in this world that is very, very strong is in some ways very, very weak. You know, everything gets balanced. And so to speak of God being so, so only strong, God would also have to have an aspect of him that is equally weak. Yeah, that's a very interesting idea. And I wouldn't be surprised. I don't know if Maimonides would go along with God being weak. Um, he might, you know, one of the ways that the rabbis understand the two words for God, Elohim, and, and yod heh vav -Hey, is that one stands for God's aspect of justice and the other stands for God's aspect of, of mercy and, and, and love. And I think that's the way at least the rabbis would understand those two extremes. So here's something kind of outrageous from a sixth century source, Shir Koma. Um, I think the, the units in the text were not miles, but parasangs. And somehow I got the conversion. So here's God's physical membership, uh, measurements. Feet, 105 million miles. Ankle to knees, 665 million miles. Neck size, 455 million miles. The circumference of his head, 10 and a half billion miles. Length of God's beard, uh, 40,250 miles. Each finger is 105 million miles. The black center of God's eye. Same size as the beard. So don't ask me. are as big as his feet. Yeah. So, so if any of you are really good at sketching, I am really not good. But I would love for someone to take these measurements and do a scale drawing of God. Uh, unless, of course, you think it's blasphemy, in which case you're excused. Well, uh, with a head that big, no yes. wonder he gets things done so slowly. The latency of his thoughts must be enormous. <laughs> Works for me. Okay, I want to talk about a central text for Kabbalah, and that is the Shema. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Hero Israel, we're going to talk a little bit about the meaning of the word Israel. yud heh vav -Hey. yud heh vav -Hey is a really interesting word. It's God's actual name, like Frank or Fred or Sam. Um, it's so holy, we never say it. Um, we don't know how to say it. When we come to it in the text and we're praying, we use the word Adonai, which means my Lord. Um, very traditional Jews won't even say Adonai or Eloheinu unless they're actually praying. As a reminder not to say it, the rabbis who put in the vowels, this was you know like 11, 1200 years ago, put in the vowels for the Hebrew word Adonai around the yud He vav He, And if you never got the memo on that and you would try and pronounce this, you would say Yehovah from where whence we get the word Jehovah. Mm -hmm. And so the people who think God's name is Jehovah never got the memo on what the rabbis, the Masorites were doing here. So listen, as we'll see, you who struggle with with God, the ineffable, nameless, the God who is too holy to be named, is our God, Adonai, this entity, is Echad. So here's just some variable ways of translating this simple prayer. Um, Adonai is one, alone, uh, indivisible, unique, ultimate, unity, or everything. I have in the bookshelf behind me a relatively small book called Echad, The Many Meanings of God as One. And there are 25 essays by different rabbis on the meaning of that one word. If you think about the idea that we could write a book on every word in the Torah to dig into it, you'll have some sense of what's going on here. And it's really an interesting book. 
I mentioned this interesting word, Yisrael, the word Israel. Jacob, one of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, gets his name changed from Yaakov, which means heal, to Yisrael when he wrestles with an entity which is God, God or an angel uh, or, a, or a person. The word Yisrael means one who wrestles with God. Um, if you struggle with God, if you have problems with God, I often reflect on times that people come to me and they say, you know, they might be talking about the COVID crisis. They might be talking about, you know, what happened to my, my loved one, what happened to my business. And I said, if God's really in charge, I got big problems with this God. My reaction to that is welcome to the club. <laughs> we are the club and our name, the name of our club is God wrestlers. We struggle with God. Uh, Erwin. Do you have something you want to I, 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 I uh, learned that uh, uh, Shema Israel comes from uh, Torah when uh, the boys were around when okay. Yaakov was dying. Midrash. And, uh, Midrash, uh, okay. Midrash. And they were saying to him, uh, Shema Israel, listen. And uh, then they continued and then they, they said, uh, the, and that uh, Adonai Echad. Right. So, so, the, so the Midrash is, Yisrael is, is, is Jacob's name. Yeah. So when he was dying in Egypt, he was worrying that his sons would go off and worship other gods. And so they tell him on his grave, listen, yeah. Israel, Adonai is our God, only Adonai. Yeah. And he's relieved. So in, the, in some of his last breaths, we can barely hear he says, Baruch Shem Kabod Malchuto Leolam Va'ed. Um, blessed is God's holy name forever and ever. But that is a midrash and another way to read the same text. Oops, let me see if I can get going here. Okay. Uh, there's also some interesting calligraphy in the uh, text of the Shema. Um, and well, I'm not going to show it to you, but I, I have a, I have a little scroll here, and I could, whoops, I could show you that indeed this is what the scroll looks like. So notice the ayin in the word Shema and the dalid in the word Shema are written quite large. So of course we're going to investigate why. So as written, uh, they're large, and you can read this as two words, meaning a uh, the word aid ayin dalid, meaning witness like Adat Elohim, the witnesses of the congregation of God. Um, so this prayer becomes our witness. Uh, also, a large ayin uh, makes sure that we don't read this word as Shema, because you might think, if you looked at it quickly, this might be an Aleph, another silent letter. And Shema means perhaps. And we don't want to say, perhaps Yisrael, Adonai is our God. And then we make the Dalad large with that little overhang, because it also resembles the word the letter resh and if we read this as aleph chet resh it would be acher meaning another god and it's traditional to write both in in uh, in torah scrolls and in um in mezuzahs and, and other places when you write this uh, those two letters are written large so the mystics then will understand this i've kind of hinted at it that the meaning of the word achad means unity. So the statement, and I would say this is, a, this is one of the things that's at the heart of Kabbalah. So this is a key one and pretty easy to understand. At the heart of Kabbalah is an understanding of God, and that is God is unity. God is the ultimate unity of the universe. Everything is God, and God is everything. The separations between us between you know you and the computer in front of you uh, is an illusion. It's like a wave in the ocean seems to be a distinct entity, but is really one with the sea. Or as my teacher Larry Kushner likes to point out, uh, he says it's like the various parts of the tree. We may give uh, parts of the tree names like the roots, uh, you know, let's say the roots, the trunk the branches, the, tw the twigs, the leaves, and so on. But the tree doesn't know where one part begins and one part ends. Everything is connected. Okay, so here's an exercise I'm going to watch you. So I'm going to move 
the thing over a little bit. So when I count to three, point to God. I don't want you to think about this a lot. So one, two, three, point to God. <laughs> Let's see if I can see where you're pointing. Okay, good work. Oh, this is making me crazy. Okay, uh, let me uh, move this back so I can see the text. Okay, there are two very reasonable traditional Jewish ways of imaging God. Uh, and they're valid. I'm not saying one is wrong and one is right. One is, I would say, more conventional and one is Kabbalistic. So here's the conventional or rational way of looking at God. God is somewhere up there and I'm somewhere down here. Every time we say the blessing, Baruch Ata Adonai, we say the word ata. Anybody know what the word ata means? You. 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 We're saying, blessed are you, Adonai. So there's some sense that this is me, and that's you, and there's a distinction and a separation. Perfectly good, perfectly rational uh, way of imaging God. The mystics image God more like this. God is everywhere and everything, so we have dotted lines. There's no border. Uh, and my separation from God is an illusion. I think I'm separate from God, but actually I and everything else in the universe is part of God. I mean, one way of thinking about it is, you know, my, my liver cells may think they're separate from me. And, you know, and a uh, hematologist, uh, I don't know who handles liver, uh, would, might, might think that, but it's still part of me. Um, the mystics understand that since everything is God, then everything is under God's control and everything is going exactly as God intends it to be. As my teacher, Larry Kushner says, this is a theology, I think his words is, you shouldn't bring within a hundred feet of a hospital. Mm -hmm. Because if you tell someone whose kid is dying or has just died, that really everything's okay because this is what God intended, uh, you're uh, you're going to have a big problem, Bryce. Yeah. So, uh, just want to make sure: is God isomor? Is God the same as the universe? I mean, is there any reason to consider the universe and God to be distinct from one another? Everything in the universe is God, in the Kabbalistic point of view. So the universe itself is God. I would say God contains everything in the universe. So the so the universe is within God. Yes, I would say so that God that is be, larger than the universe. Does God yeah, I, I would probably say that. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Rabbi, okay. Rabbi, um, yes. I, yeah, I, Jay. I have two questions. I'm really bothered by this. Uh, Me too. Uh, under the control and will of God. If if uh, if the Kabbalists feel that way and understand that way and want to think that way. Are we to assume that God is controlling the virus? No. Um, no. So uh, whoever said no, uh, amplify. I, I, I think this is man-made, not God-made. Okay, 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 okay. Let, 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 me, let me just clarify. I, my understanding of Kabbalah is that a Kabbalist would say, Everything is going exactly according to God's plan, and the virus is part of God's plan. I don't agree with this. I, you know, I, 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 one of my uh, points when I started was, was the point that I am not a Kabbalist. And this is, by the way, one of the reasons why. Because it says that the cancer, the accident, the war, the gas chambers are under the control and the will of God. And I personally have great difficulty with this. Um, so I am not a Kabbalist, but I want to present Kabbalah the way I understand it. And I, I'm pretty sure I understand this. Now they would say, the Kabbalists, obey the mitzvot, do God's work. And God's work is healing. God's work is to be doctors. God's work is to feed the hungry. So you don't just say, well, if you're hungry and you're sick, it's God's will. I'm not going to get involved. 
because the mitzvot are there. And remember, the goal of the Kabbalists is mystic, to get me to do God's will. And so you could say the reason for the illness was to humble us and make us more sensitive to, uh, to the needs of others and do God's will. I have huge problems with this, uh, but, but I, I want to present you know, the way a Kabbalist would present it. Erwin. Since Adam and Eve, uh, uh, since they were dismissed from the uh, uh, Garden of Eden, they, we don't see God. Therefore, uh, if you agree that we see the tree, but we don't see God. The tree is God, but we don't see God. We see the tree. Uh, which tree? That. The, the tree? Any of tree, Nauta. any tree. Yeah, the, I would say the tree is part of God. The, no, it's not part of God, it is God. No, because to say the tree is God would say that God is uniquely the tree and there is nothing else to God. It's like saying, here's my hand, this hand is Mike. No, this hand is part of me, but it's not the entirety of me. Uh, Ken. Yeah. Okay. So there's a difference, though, between what the Kabbalists are saying and what a fatalist would say. The, the, that, it, and so, and it's hard for us to to see that difference here, because it sounds the same. Yes, I I, I agree with you. A fatalist would say, "What can you do?" Um, sorry, I was unlowering. I was lowering your hand. Uh, the fatalist would say, "What can you do? It's hopeless." The Kabbalists would say, God has told us what to do. Um, Can I ask a quick question? I don't yes. even... Yeah, Valerie, go ahead. Because um, I'm, I'm struggling here with, we're talking about... Good, you're Yisrael, you're struggling with God. <laughs> yes, <Yeah, shakoyach. laughs> We're talking about, is the virus man-made or God-made? Well, if there's no separation between everything yes. and God, then the virus itself under this perspective is an aspect of God as well. Right. I, I would say that would be what a Kabbalist would say. Rabbi, can I chime in here? I've been raising sure. my hand, but you didn't see it, I guess. Uh, for some reason, it didn't show up. I'm sorry. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, now, if God is larger than the universe, the universe is part of God, it's kind of like we don't have control of every little bacterium or every little blood cell or any every little mm -hmm. liver cell inside our bodies, in which case it just does what it needs to do, uh, in which case I would say that uh, God doesn't have control of every little thing that is inside of him. In other words, the universe but it's all part of him. So I, I, yeah. I would agree with you, but I, I don't think a, the Kabbalists would agree with you. Well, that's I, all right. They have, uh, they, they have. Here's, their, I, don't know if you, uh, I don't know if you can see this. This, this is a I can magnet. barely see it. Uh, every, every, what does it say? Every blade of grass has an angel that bends over it and whispers, grow, grow. That's a mystical interpretation. I think God would say every, I don't know if I'm you, you know, every antibody in your bloodstream is hovered over by an angel or by God. There's really no difference. And an appropriate prayer would be for you to direct those antibodies to the infectious agent and, and encourage them to fight for you. Ken. And some people actually Sorry. think that this, that this works to a certain extent, that you yes. have it in your mind that you know and you concentrate on on fighting the cancer and supposedly at least in some cases it seems to uh, it seems to do some good right i would say that is the kabbalistic view yeah. and i would also guess that you know through the placebo effect it might actually work mm -hmm. if you if you think it's it's effective. Ken, can I can I get back to that okay. that one Sorry. thing about God being strong and weak for a second? Because I had a thought, but it didn't come through. Okay. Uh, all right. The idea about God being strong as opposed to weak, and I think somebody said something about God can also be weak. 
I think there's an explanation for this in that if a material is strong, it also needs to be not weak, but not brittle. You would yeah. say that yeah, yeah, yeah. brittle I, I, I is agree a with you in terms of material science, but and I don't so think God I don't think Maimonides. Same thing. God yeah. cannot be brittle. He has to be. He has to be strong, but not totally unbending. Yeah, what Maimonides is saying is you can't say anything positive. You don't. You can only say what God is not. Ken. So they, I think some people are getting caught up with is where does God end and the universe begin, and is God is the universe part of God and all that. There's. It, and it is in there is the concept of sin sum, so that that God um, contracted God's self in order to make room for the universe. We're going to be talking about that next time <laughs> in Luriana Kabbalah. Yes. I want to give it one sense about this though, that I have huge problems with this, as as you know, but there is one sense in which it can be comforting, and that is. The idea that someone's really in charge and a benevolent, loving presence is really controlling things. And we're not just at the whims and the wills of nature, but in this madness that's going on, God really has a purpose. And maybe someday, maybe, you know, after we die and we have God's perspective, <laughs> we will realize that it wasn't just, you know, nuts, but there really was a purpose behind it. Harold Kushner, who is not a proponent of this, uh, in his book, When Bad Things Happen to Good People, talks about a, a couple coming to him, and the couple has just lost, I think, if my memory is correct, you know, a young woman daughter, like a 19-year-old daughter in a horrible car accident. And they confess to her, they confess, sorry, to Rabbi Kushner, that last Yom Kippur, they didn't fast. And so they, they believe that because they didn't fast, this was the reason their daughter was killed. Um, on one level, that's a nightmare. On many levels, it's a nightmare. On another level, it gives you a hint, like the magic, which I consider to be magical, that if I can do everything absolutely correctly, um, I can get control over God. I once met a guy on an airplane flying to Tel Aviv, and he had a mangled hand, and we got into a deep theological discussion. Uh, you won't be surprised that this happens to me a lot. Um, <laughs> and he, as a, as a point of proof, he showed me his hand, and he said, my hand was mangled in an industrial accident. And when I checked my mezuzahs, here's a mezuzah scroll, he said after the accident, when he checked his mezuzah scroll, he found out where it says in the, in the mezuzah, in the Shema, al yadecha, find them as a sign upon your hand, the word for yad, for his hand, had flaked off. Oh my so God. he understood the, the idea that because he wasn't diligent about maintaining his mezuzah scroll, that he lost his hand. I find that horrible. I wouldn't work for such a god. <laughs> but he found it comforting, and I can understand that because it gives him a job. Now he's going to be much more diligent, you can bet, about checking not only his mezuzah scrolls, but his family's mezuzah scrolls, and he, and he can have some sense of confidence that if he does that, uh, he will have control over those kinds of things. Ken? So as distasteful as the whole Deuteronomistic concept of right. do things and everything will be good and if you don't do things everything will be bad as distasteful as it is it's very empowering that yes. we have within our control the ability to do right or to wrong and in in that sense it's empowering as opposed to everybody else who says there's nothing we can do because exactly. it's going to happen anyway exactly and at exactly least it, it is a, a pathway towards making it good it is literally empowering. Valerie Grossman. I think there's, here we're saying we're all Kabbalistic perspective. We're all part of God. God's made in our image. So perhaps by these actions, 
we made are, in God's uh, image. We're made in God's right, image. Right, right. But if we are a, a part of God, yes, we're made in God's image. We're mm -hmm. a part of God. Mm -hmm. In doing these actions, are we then, like you said, it's not a punishment so much as we created the outcome in the first place. God like, created the outcome in the first place. But yeah. if we're part of God, then to me, why do you need that extra step? By being a part of God, aren't we the ones creating the consequence? Um, the, I'm, I'm not sure what you mean by that, but what I will say is it's going the way God intends it to go. <clears throat> uh, that's my understanding of the Kabbalistic insight. Bryce. Well, a couple things. One, I reject uh, this whole concept that... Uh, that every uh, virus, uh, every molecule, every nucleus, every quark has an angel guiding it because uh, it's the very definition of needlessly multiplying entities that Occam's razor speaks to. Second yeah, thing, I, I, I just want to emphasize what they mean by that is God is controlling it and the vehicle is an the, angel. I understand. The, and, I, I, and I agree with you. And, and, and the second, uh, second issue, too, is that if, uh, if, if, if everything in the universe is contained within God and God is in, then, then you have no um, ability to be outside of God. You are part of God, and therefore all of your actions are being determined by God. And so that, that Torah scroll is not your fault because you're part of God and that's the way God wanted it. So the, the, the difficulty, which is in part of the teachings, is the idea that we have free will. So I would say my understanding of this is the Kabbalists would say we have free will, but God knows what our free will choice is going to be and planned it that way. But we really do have free will. And I, I agree that's that that's a contra that's nuts. I, I, I would I would say, call it a contradiction in terms. Um, the way I would describe it is, and this is a, a, a way I approach I use all the time, is imagine you're watching the movie, you know, Friday the thirteenth, part seventeen. And the sweet young thing is in the in the in the room. And she's looking for, uh, I don't know, she's looking for the way out. And, and the guy with the chainsaw and the hockey mask is behind the middle door. And she's trying to decide which, uh, which door should I pick? Um, and uh, she's going toward the middle door and we're yelling, no, 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 don't do it. But in fact, whichever door she's going to pick, that movie's already been shot, and we have already seen it three times. But still, we're caught up in the story. So the idea here is, it's, it's, it's my insight into how to understand this. My idea here is that we have free will, but God's seen the movie, because God exists outside of time, and God knows what our free will choice will be. That doesn't his, mean anything. <laughs> Uh, okay, well, you, it may not mean anything to you, and I don't believe it, but I'm trying to understand how it can be true. I think there is an inherent conflict, but in the, in the Mishnah, in the Pirkei Avot, it says, all is foreseen, yet free will is given. And in the Talmud, it says, everything is under the control of God, except Yerat Hashem, except the fear or awe of God. Um, let me see if we have any more. Okay, good. So we are actually at the end well, of, of this presentation, uh, and, but we are not at the end of our discussion. So if people want to chime in. I have a question. Yes. Uh, under the control of God, I would like to refer to these poor Jewish people in Pittsburgh who are dominating on a Shabbos morning, and this idiot comes through the back door. Right and start shooting. How in the world can I, as an aging Jew in Thousand Oaks, California, believe that they were under the control of God? Well, first I would and say, okay, hold on, hold on. First, let me say, I absolutely agree with you. And that's why I'm not a Kabbalist. And that's why you, you know, if a Kabbalist were comforting these people, 
the Kabbalist, if he had or she had any brains, would never say what happened is God's will. But that's why I have a problem with this. Um, and the problem is that we see it and we understand it. Um, you and I might, you know, on, um, on Pesach night, we say God took us out of Egypt, right? And freed us so we could go get the law at Mount Sinai, right? And we sing, die, die, enu, die, die, enu. And, you know, we eat matzah and we have gefilte fish and we have a great old time. But for 400 years, Jews were slaves in Egypt, according to the story. So was that God's will that we should be slaves? And so we could have the honor of receiving the Torah. So what I would say is the mystical Kabbalistic understanding is it's all going the way God intends it to go. I tell you, I'll tell you again and again and again, I have a huge problem with that. And I don't accept it. And I actually enrolled in a rabbinic institute called the, the Institute for Jewish Spirituality. And I went to a retreat and I studied with people and we talked about this stuff. And um, I can't remember if my late wife had passed on or she was in the throes of Huntington's disease at the time. And I could not handle it. And I said, you know, I, I understand this. I'm interested in it but I can't spend, it was like a two or three year program. I'm not gonna spend two or three years of my time deeply trying to understand something that I find uh, immoral. So I absolutely agree with you, but the purpose of this class is not Rabbi Latker's problems and understanding of Kabbalah, it's an introduction to Kabbalah. But I'm quite sure the Kabbalists would say, in some sense, this is all part of God's will. I mean, we can, you know, people will say, even at this late date, that the upshot of the Holocaust was to give us a state of Israel. I think many of us would say the idea that that's the intention of God. God I'm sorry? Six million had to die in order for us to get the state of Israel. Right. So, that's a pretty um, high price. I'm can sorry? I, can I... That's yeah. So, 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 but people will say that that's, that's not an idea that you will never hear, but I want to point out the, the, the difficulties with it. For, for one thing, uh, it makes the Nazis the instrument of God. I got a big problem with that. <laughs> Yet when the, uh, you know, yes. when the, when the temple is destroyed by the, by the Babylonians, um, the traditional rabbinic understanding is that it was destroyed because Jews sinned and didn't follow the rules. And so that we seem to accept because that was, you know, 2,600 years ago, and we don't have a big problem with it. Uh, but, but I'm telling you, that's, that is what's going on with, with Kabbalah. Can I throw uh, something in, Rabbi? Sure. All right, back to the idea of God saw the movie and he knew what was going to happen, and so whatever happens, happens. I suggest that not only God saw the movie and knew what was going to happen, God produced and directed the movie. Okay, that's an interesting distinction. My, my only point about that image is inside the movie, the character seems to have free will. Mm -hmm. She's making the decision about which door to open but we know she really doesn't have any choice in it because the film's been in the can for a year and a half or maybe 10 years. Not only years. that, but the producer and director and writers told her what she must right. do in that film anyway. So yes, she doesn't have a choice even right. though the movie is supposed right. to. But in, in the con so in the context of her life, as we image, but we're, te we're, you know, we're yelling at her, don't pick that door. As, and we really don't want her to pick that. And you, know, you watch a really good movie and something terrible happens and you feel awful and sad and you may be moved to tears, although it's just a movie, right? So, so that's what a Kabbalist would say about our life. We believe we have free will, but that belief is an illusion because our life is really going the way God intends. And Kabbalahs believe that? Yes. Erwin. Uh, 
I, I don't know anything about pharmacology, okay? But I would like to use an example for pharmacology and uh, Kabbalist. Mm -hmm. And I would like to know if you believe that the Kabbalist think there is a patient in the hospital and the nurse comes in in the little uh, cup and there is five medication mm -hmm. and the patient takes the five different medication and uh, do you think the Kabbalist believes that God directs the pill that your blood pressure will gonna go down from this pill uh, uh, the tremor in your hand gonna go away from the other pill. Uh, do, do you think the the yeah? So I, what I would are, say is no, no. Uh, do you think the Kabbalists are so naive that it believes they believe that uh, the God directs the pills where should they go? Because then hold on, let me answer it, the no, let, no, me... let let me finish. That there is a thing now called nanotechnology yeah they're gonna they're gonna develop uh, something a pill which when you sw uh, inject it intravenously it attaches itself to the red blood cell and then it's gonna go automatically to the tumor side do right. you think the cover is okay. so let, me let me let me answer the question uh the answer to the question is both the kabbalists and i would say that God has given humanity intelligence, and part of our intelligence is the ability to create medications which are effective against diseases, whether those medication is an antibiotic or a nanotechnology attaching to a blood cell. And it is God's given wisdom that enabled us to learn this technology and that, um, it is God's mitzvah that tells us to heal the sick and to make the world a better place. And so in that sense, yes, God, God created the technology and controls the technology. And I believe a poetic understanding of that is that every little nano item or, grain or molecule of antibiotic has an angel guiding it to the site. Uh, a pharmacologist would say, no, it has a molecular structure designed to interact with the, you know, with whether what, what it's attacking. So the way I understand Kabbalah and the way I make peace with Kabbalah is that it is a poetic insight. And I love it as a poetic insight, but I don't take it literally. But I have to tell you, I have asked scholars of Kabbalah and Kabbalists, whether they take it literally, and the answer they give me is yes, and I believe them. But I, I understand it poetically, and it makes sense to me poetically. But but I you know I have to be honest; they would say uh, it's literal. Ken. So there there is a uh, drash that helps to one way of understanding this dilemma. I'm not saying it's the greatest way of list, of looking at it. It deals with when there were the cities of refuge. And the mm -hmm. cities of refuge is when a murderer was, um, what, when, a, when somebody committed murder, they were tried and, and found guilty and whatever. But the person who committed manslaughter was supposed to run to the nearest city of refuge where he would be protected from the blood of the, the, per, yeah. the family right. of the person mm -hmm. that he inadvertently killed. And there's this story where there was a murderer and a and a uh, manslayer who were on their way to the city of refuge, and not nobody knew when they got to this little tavern in the in the city of refuge who they were, and the tavern was completely packed and there was no room for anybody. There was a ladder though in the middle of the tavern, and the manslayer climbed up on top of the ladder because that was the only place he could sit. And the murderer got underneath the ladder because that was the only place that was left. And at one point, the manslayer falls off of the ladder and lands on the murderer and kills him. And at that point, everybody in the tavern knows that this poor man that fell off of the ladder had no intention of killing this poor man that was at the bottom, but he is a manslayer and now he needs to 
go through, be protected from the family of this person at the bottom. The point of the story is we are in the tavern. We don't know that it was the murderer that was killed. Mm -hmm. And we don't know that it was the manslayer that committed manslaughter in front of us. Right. And so what a Kabbalist might try and do is find God's underlying logic. And I got big problems with that. So for example, <laughs> why did the the Jews of Germany suffer more than anyone else? Because Reform Judaism came out of Germany. Therefore, a million and a half children are gassed. I got a problem with that. But I understand the process, which is the one you describe, of trying to understand God's will. There's a, you know, there's a legend. And that of, explanation may not be the actual explanation. It's right. one that has been offered up, right. and it may fall flat because it's not the true explanation. Right. Um, okay. Uh, so we have uh, one, some hands that are up. Uh, Valerie. But I think also the realization that we are humans, we are not God. And while we are alive in these bodies on this planet as humans and not God, the idea that we would fully understand any of God's logic in this lifetime, to me is beyond, we, we have to accept at a certain point, we aren't going to understand God's logic. We are just merely people. And as such, there's going to be limitations. Yes, I would, I would second that point, and I would say if we take the idea of God seriously, then we certainly should be willing to admit that we can't possibly understand all of God in God's entirety. I think at the end of this, I have a legend of the blind people examining the elephant, and you know, different people get a different sense of what the nature of the elephant is. Um, and that's actually how, what I think about other religions, is we are different folks trying to understand the nature of the unity that binds the universe together, and not surprisingly, we can't figure it out, and not surprisingly, we each come away with some different ideas. Okay, I am going to call the official uh, program to an end.